Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Work Plus Live uh, webinar session. This is an opportunity for you to hear from and interact with the 2021 Best Places to Work. My name is Rinka Lavrencic. I am the CEO of Work Plus, and I will be your host today. Before we begin, I would like us all to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we find ourselves on today. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which all of you are living, working and learning from today. As we share our knowledge, may we respect their eldest past, present and emerging. So this is our final installment for the 2021 Workplace Best uh, Places to Work live webinar series. The 2022 Best Places to Work list will be announced on August 4th and our 2022 series will commence shortly after that uh, later in the year. So today's topic is one we have all, all been um, feeling pressure on today. It is innovation and feedback. So what can we do to encourage feedback in today's market? And how can we um, use that to translate that into innovation? So we have a big panel for today. Joining us today, we have Caroline Artia, Head of People and Culture at Coloplast. We have uh, Dr. Stephen Dudgeon and uh, Dr. Eli James fr uh, from Avenue Dental. We have Jack Batera mclean from Bluefin, Fred Vandertank, CEO from Make It Cheaper, and Oscar Trimboli, a deep listening expert. So thank you all so much for joining us today. And I uh, really appreciate you giving up your time to talk with us today. So essentially, uh, get, getting feedback from employees falls within the realm of uh, upward communication. Upward communication is the process in which employees can directly communicate with upper management and provide feedback, share ideas, raise concerns regarding their day to day work and life. Social distancing, remote work, constant organisational change are all reshaping the way employees can communicate not only with each other, but with their managers. Historically, downward communication was considered the most important type of communication. Um, however, as organisations are becoming increasingly employee centric, upward communication is rising in importance. Um, the last two years have increased employers' awareness of employees' well-being, safety, productivity while working from home, and upward communication has definitely increased an opportunity for employees to speak up. Listening to employees builds, builds a sense of ownership and commitment to the organisation, and when leaders genuinely listen to employees, it can uh, the, ro the results can be quite transformative. Upward communication is present among organisations that are successfully building um, cultures that are inclusive, participative and engaging. Companies that foster upward communication can enjoy many benefits, including um, workplace transparency, better team collaboration, easier decision making and therefore a better employee experience. Creating opportunities for feedback is the cornerstone of any innovative approach and our team members are an incredible source of information and ideas for the organisation. These insights allow our organisations to adapt, to evolve and to grow. Innovation doesn't only affect our ability to be successful with clients, it also plays a large role in retaining and engaging our current team members. Um, moreover, today, when many employees are working in a hybrid environment, managers and organisations are introducing new ways to communicate with the teams. We will hear from a selection of organisations in what they are doing to communicate their organisation, uh, communicate with their team members. Um, but however, Oscar, uh, Oscar Trimboli, who is a deep listener, uh, is here to share another insight around listening that we don't necessarily pick up on. So, Oscar, welcome. Thank you for joining our website, uh, webinar today. Uh, you know, that classic uh, 2020 to 2022 line, you are on mute. <laughs> G'day. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well and uh, great, great to see everybody today. 
I think when it comes to listening for innovation, Serenko, I remember in 2015, I was in a workshop uh, in Melbourne in a, in a very small meeting room, but we had some remote people dialing in from other parts of the country and the region. And what was interesting, we were just before lunch and I knew it was just before lunch because the leader of the group was tapping on the desk and pointing to the to the clock on the wall, say food, food's coming. And we were doing an exercise to describe this team. And the way people were describing the team was as, a, as an animal. Uh, they were describing a bird of prey. They were describing a cheetah, a leopard, anything that was fast and agile. But out of the corner of my eye for the 12 people who were involved, there was one person who hadn't had a chance to speak or maybe chose not to speak up. And I think for anybody who leads workshops, whether they're hybrid or whether they're face to face, or whether they're online exclusively, is are you conscious enough as a host to listen to the voices that haven't said anything? I think innovation emerges when we listen to what's not said rather than listening exclusively to what is said. In that moment, Lynn was the last person to speak, a card carrying member of the introvert community. And I just gestured to her. I didn't ask her to offer anything. And I said to her with just a simple nod. Now remember everybody's described snakes, uh, sorry, uh, eagles and birds of prey and cheetahs and leopards. And Lynn described the group. She said, I thought it was obvious. I thought we were a snake. And with that, the room and the tension in the room really changed because everybody has probably some relatively negative connotations about snakes. Now, what you don't know about Lynn is her cultural background is Chinese and their orientation to snakes is very different. I just gestured to her to continue. And she said, we've forgotten to shed our skin. So Lynn was from finance as well. And she said, a lot of our practices and systems haven't evolved to where our customers need them to be. And if we learn to shed our skin, we'll learn to make the kinds of changes our current customers need, not just what our old customers need. So as you listen in, I'm curious, are you conscious, are you deliberate about listening to what's not said, or are you only listening to what is said? A really simple piece of maths that you should take away from today is this, 125, 400 and 900. I can speak at 125 words per minute, yet I can think at 900 words per minute. So if you only listen to the very first thing I say or the thing that's top of mind, you're listening to 11% of what I think. So whether you're designing surveys, whether you're having feedback conversations up, please take the time to pause. Be careful and listen to what's not said, because when you listen to what's not said, you'll hear 86% of the conversation rather than single digits. That's a really um, interesting insight and a way to put it. When we spoke a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about some of the challenges organisations are facing with remote work. You know, everything has a, uh, a, a bonus and a challenge to it as well. And one of the challenges with remote work is that we're at best getting a two-dimensional, two-and-a-half-dimensional conversation with our team members. We're not picking up on physical cues and, um, and, and physical communication that happens when we ask a question. And one of the things you said to me uh, was rather than ask people how, how are you, ask three different questions. Um, yeah, and those, those three questions should it be about... Um, what does nutrition mean for you right now? What does exercise mean for you right now? What does sleeping mean for you right now? I think those three questions will give you very different insights. And ask them in that order, because if you're gonna ask somebody, you don't have a great relationship, how much sleep are you getting at the moment? They'll be completely confused. But they signal to different parts of your hierarchy of needs, but they are also gonna give you more explicit, actionable insights. Uh, it, when when COVID kicked off, I asked one of my clients, a CEO of a big ad agency group, um, what does nutrition mean for you right now? And she said, look, if we would have had this, me the meeting was at two o'clock. She said, if we would have had this meeting at 10 o'clock, I would have been feeling like an angel and perfect. 
But to be honest, Oscar, I've just demolished a packet of Tim Tams. And we had a conversation in that moment about not the team, well, not the Tim Tams, but what triggered that? What was it that required her to gorge herself on a lot of sugar to push her through performance for the rest of the day and talk through the consequences of that? So I think sometimes we we listen in a virtual environment in a really generic sense. We just need to tune in. Uh, another one of my clients uh, really values the outdoor and I asked her, what does exercise mean for you right now? And she says it means frustration um, because we're in that part of the lockdown where you could only go within five kilometres of your home. But again, because she was able to talk to something specific rather than g'day, how are you going? Uh, we were able to get to some really basic tactics to talk about, okay, what other forms of exercise can you do besides your regular run routine? And as a result of that, she was able to listen to her body in a really different way. So the more specific you can ask those questions in a remote environment, the more helpful it will be. And just a, a, a final one, uh, we were working with a team uh, across the country, and it was really interesting because every member of the team had their virtual corporate background behind them. And I asked the group, given that one of the organisational values is transparency and another one was authenticity, how authentic is it to have a corporate logo in the background rather than your home? Well, we were doing this each week and what had happened the following week is two people turned their virtual backgrounds off and it all of a sudden created a dialogue between people in the room, virtual, uh, about what was in the background. And, and one of them was about their painting and it cre created a great connection in the group. So listening is not always auditory. Sometimes it's visual as well. And I can't help but think a number of you are wondering Oscar, why the heck are there so many Yodas in the background? Because people just keep sending to me, them to me after presentations. I've only ever seen Star Wars once, but at least it gives you something to chat about. Oh, thank you so much, Oscar, for your insights. Um, Oscar actually has a new book coming out later this year, so we will have a special workshop about listening available for the Work Plus um, community, and we'll let you know about that a little bit later on. Thanks again, Oscar. So one of those elements that we are continually struggling with, uh, it's unfortunately nothing new post-COVID. The shortage of available labour has been present in the Australian economy for well over a decade. And we're all looking for different ways to not only retain the team that we have, but attract new members into our organisation. Uh, across 2021, we have been so fortunate that there were two recruitment agencies on the best places to work a list. There were six degrees executive recru recruitment, as well as Bluefin Resources. And um, Jack has been so generous in offering his time uh, during these webinars to give us an insight into what recruiters are hearing from candidates and what candidates are looking for in terms of a workplace experience on each of the topics we have covered over the six month, last six months. So thank you, Jack, for being um, part of this today as well. Pleasure. So down to my classic questions that I ask you every time. Um, what are candidates asking their recruitment specialists when they are looking for a new role, specifically around the prospective um, employers feedback and innovation strategies? Yeah, look, I think, I mean, at Bluefin, we're a specialist recruitment firm, which often works with clients who <clears throat> have innovation or evolution focused projects, particularly when it comes to transformation. So the kinds of roles we recruit for are often central to digital transformation or innovation centric projects. Um, it's where they come to us uh, to find that great talent that can assist there. So naturally, one of the biggest selling points of these kinds of roles is innovation itself. Uh, and candidates are often a, a inspired or swayed, I suppose, by a role where it's clear the impact uh, that change or innovation their role will help drive within that organisation or specific project. So I think I, I've got a good sort of case study for that, and it's Woolworths versus Woolies X. They're both great clients of ours, and obviously Woolies X is a subsidiary of Woolworths. So Woolies X was actually formed in 2017 as a startup from Woolworths to drive e-commerce and digital innovation um, through data-led transformation. So where Woolworths obviously has a brand of being a larger organisation, which has its own merits and values and proposition, 
Woolies Exit position themselves as a really nimble startup, which is acutely focused on innovation and transformation. So through doing this, they've been able to attract the kinds of talent they need to scale this digital and data side of their organisation. So I think that's a really good insight into where, I mean, I'm not saying that we should all go start up subsidiaries of our organisations to pitch to innovation where we know the kinds of tech talent we need to attract. But I think it's a really good insight as to, I don't believe all these X would ever have been created had they not gotten feedback or insights from people and the market as to what an attractive or a compelling offer would be uh, for a transformation or a digital uh, tech focused organisation. And I think they clearly saw that there was an opportunity to have its own separate business with its own culture values and propositions. So I thought that was a really good case study of our clients and what they've done there. Um, as for feedback, I think it's interesting. Obviously, we look at organisations um, obviously at a at a high level, but I think we also then have a look at feedback as like just feedback, right? Managers giving feedback upwards and downwards. So where hiring managers can really unpack, I think, for us and what we see um, and how they can articulate how they give and receive feedback both at an organisational and managerial level throughout the interview process, it really creates a great insight, I think, to the kinds of experience that the candidate might have working for that organisation and for that business. Um, it's something that we include in our, our interview notes here at Bluefin to make sure that we're asking those questions. How do you like to give feedback? How do you like to get it? What are kind of the, the, the programs that we have? So I guess what I'm trying to say is the more aligned your managers can be on the ground on giving and receiving feedback to how the organisation gives and receive feedback, I think is where you'll find a great cultural value and, and great shifts and insight. Yeah, and have you noticed from your clients that they're changing the way that they're wording job descriptions and wording advertising to to um, to show that they are uh, an inclusive organisation that welcomes feedback and looks for that you know special talent that you uh, yeah. have to bring to to help them innovate. Yeah, I think the last webinar I spoke a bit about employee value propositions for organisations and how you don't always have to necessarily have the fanciest offering, but often a compelling, bespoke and well-articulated offering is just as effective. And I think that approach can also be said for job advertisements or position descriptions as well. So I think if we interchange our innovation for the word maybe evolution, which is one of our core values here at Bluefin, people want to see the opportunities the role has to transform and change a business, what that direct impact could look like. So for instance, at Bluefin, since the pandemic, our reception role has completely evolved. We don't really need reception anymore. And we've evolved that role into a concierge and experience focus role for our people and our customers. Um, so what used to be a fairly transactional, mundane role has now evolved into an imperative part of our insights and feedback loop, um, as that role now interacts as the first point of contact for our people, our clients or our candidates. So I think we can often often look, overlook frontline workers for the valuable insights that they can drive in an organisation. Um, so I'm really proud of Bluefin at the way we've been able to evolve a role like that into such an imperative part of our insights journey. Um, and that obviously enables us to make better decisions for our people and our customers as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jack, for your insights. Uh, now, before we hear from uh, a couple of the other panel members around what it is that their organisations are doing to increase uh, feedback and innovation, I have some uh, quick steps for you that you might think about when creating an, um, a culture of upward communication in your workplace. So, like everything, we need to start with getting the, uh, the managers buy-in. The reason being is that the managers are going to play a really important role in driving upward communication in the workplace. We need to make sure that upper management uh, is open to listening and are welcoming uh, their feedback into their circle. And uh, mid-level managers and supervisors and team leaders really need to um, be open to driving a two-way conversation with their team leaders, with their team members and driving um, that information that they collect up through the organisation. We need to understand our audience and who we are communicating to. We briefly um, spoke about this as well during our diversity and inclusion webinar as well. We need to be aware of who we're communicating with, how they will receive that um, communication, whether it's written, whether it's verbal, whether it's visual. But we also need to be careful around what language we are using. If we're operating across territories, we need to consider um, cultural effects and uh, elements and also thinking about the neurodivergent uh, employees we have in the workplace as well, ensuring that we're not using confusing uh, communication. 
We need to create channels that um, help employees express their ideas and concerns. And if you think about it, when we send out an email blast or an ER or an office e-newsletter, that's really a one-way communication. It doesn't um, open up an opportunity for feedback and for a group discussion of elements. So thinking about um, technology that you might be using, such as Slack or special interest groups on um, intranet or other, other technology. There's been so many products that have come out over the last two years. Um, a lot of them have been very much designed for driving communication and driving ideas and continuing a conversation between all levels and all departments of the organisation. Uh, this definitely helps us uh, generate employee um, driven content as well. So helping our team members implement ideas that uh, that they are discussing. And instead of, um, we want to make sure that we encourage regular, regular employees to create and publish their own stories, to share their solutions, to share their ideas about what can be done, what needs to be done, and where they see gaps in the organisation. We also need to um, therefore support managers with knowledge and tools. Uh, one of the biggest blocks we see in all elements of employee engagement in the organisation is that we don't focus enough time on managers, um, helping them understand what tools and resources the organisation has at their disposal in order to drive change and in order to deliver the programs that we have. And, you know, um, communication and upward uh, communication and feedback is definitely one of those elements. Uh, we need to have a look at how we can encourage leaders to be authentic and approachable. Prior to COVID, very common for um, senior leadership to travel around the different offices, to be very present in, in, in the offices, on the floor, having lunch with different teams, having lunch with um, different departments, uh, different levels of seniority and um, being accessible to them for feedback. We need to have a think about how we do that in a hybrid environment. We don't want to um, miss out on inclusion from employees who are not working from the office. And of course, we need to um, measure employees' engagement. We need some data uh, to help us drive decisions around what is working and what is not working uh, within our organisations and, um, and help us make some decisions to make it a better workplace. So, to help us um, understand and to learn from some of the organisations that are on the best places to work list, uh, we have a couple of guest speakers. Uh, first, we have uh, Eli from Avenue Dental. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Um, so Eli, at Avenue Dental, you provide numerous opportunities for team members to provide feedback, to ask questions and to communicate with management. Can you share with us the 90-day ACORN process as how it relates to innovation and feedback and how successful the initiative has been? Yeah, hey, going. thank you so much. We're <clears throat> Avenue Dentals. Steve and I here are a small network of dental practices on the Sunshine Coast predominantly, and our purpose is to positively transform dentistry. And one of the big things that we, we try to implement as part of that is amazing workplace cultures and we've won a number of awards in that area. So we're very passionate about this and we're really thankful to be able to talk about it because we just love talking about it all the time. We love so talking <laughs> to you'll have to interrupt me probably to, to cut me off at some point. But um, as, as a bit of background, we have five year goals, which are um, Angel Oaks. And you can see on our logo there, there's a, an, an oak tree. <clears throat> So that's split down into our little saplings, which is our one yearly goals, and then our acorns, as you mentioned, which is our 90 day goals. <clears throat> so our 90 day goals or our acorns are what drives performance at the team level. There is a management component of it as well, but it's really about engaging with the team to try to get them on board with the bigger picture and the long term goals. And a lot of that comes back to innovation. Um, um, so it's an exciting area for us. So the first thing it starts with is a quarterly team survey. And I know a lot of the other speakers are talking about being open as a management team. We personally are rated by the team uh, in the anonymous survey. So we get to see you know, how the team thinks of us 
and uh, we often have a competition between the two of us as to who's rated higher. So <laughs> the credit card probably gets whipped out a little bit more <laughs> because of that. <laughs> um, but then also the team gets to rate the practice, what's going well, what's not going well, and how we might be able to do better. So that's one point of feedback. And then after that, and before the ACORN is, is launched, we have a quarterly strategy meeting where we get together with all our management team, all our partners, and, and uh, we sit through and work through the biggest issues. They give us feedback. We, we bring in feedback from the team, and we also have our bigger um, Angel Oak goals that we want to achieve as well. And we develop uh, something, hopefully, that will engage people, make people feel connected to the purpose of the organization, make them feel like they're contributing, making a difference, but also we're achieving our business goals as well. And so we found very early on that we could have the very best plans in the world, the most amazing, you know, sort of strategy. But if no one was committed to it and no one wanted to be part of it, it wouldn't go anywhere. <laughs> and so it took us probably four or five years of butting our head up against the wall before we really started trying to listen as hard as we could. Um, so in general, the acorns revolve around clinical outcomes, which is sort of the operation of what we do. Uh, cultural goals, making the team feel connected, uh, lean or cost initiatives, and then also customer service and wowing our, our customers. So they're the general themes and they always relate back to our core values, get power. Um, so we basically try to implement everything as a system and we try and reinforce the values at every stage as well. Um, <clears throat> so for example, one of the uh, uh, goals we had during COVID everyone was stretched to the limit everyone was overworked people were doing double shifts overtime was through the roof we had a few resignations from people just not wanting to to put in the effort it's a very hard job what we do um particularly for the support staff um and so we listened to the feedback and instead of going for a high uh, accountability clinical based or cost based goal we went back to values and culture and we uh did uh, it was called happy two because we had another one happy on happy so one vision. of our values positive and fun so we tried to make it around that um, value and um and we had gratitude journaling because as we probably all know saying nice things about other people giving them positive feedback makes you feel good too it gives you a sense of purpose so that was a big part of it we had a lot of team building exercises we nominated and then awarded our core values champions for each of our values. So people won awards based on their performance and it was on the nominations of their team members. So we collated all the responses into a nice story about those winners and then gave them a trophy. <laughs> and we had our Flourish Day, which is an annual day where we uh, really promote the culture of values at Avenue Dental, plus use a little bit of positive psychology so we can all grow a little bit more. And now, where we're, we're executing on a more clinical based thing so we're back on track we're working as a team again and it's um moving us towards um a bigger goal in the future that sounds great thank you so much uh for your insights i think when we start talking about innovation most organizations feel like that's only applicable to technology companies uh, but it's it's not. I, I assume that you know being in the medical field, it's um, quite strict in in how creative you can get with uh, with doing the work that you do. How, however, innovation isn't just tied to that. It's it also um, adds to how the organisation is run, processes, um, how the yeah. team can work together better together as well. Yeah, exactly. And for us, innovation in dentistry is having a great culture because. Probably everyone's been to a dental clinic, which feels like, you know, not the most exciting. It's definitely not the, the you know, headquarters at Apple <laughs> or anything like that. There's a certain smell, there's a certain sound, there's a certain feel. It's not great. And we're, we're trying to buck that trend and try and create something different, not only for customers and, and, um, and patients, but employees and, and team members as well. That's oh, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, Fred. Uh, Fred's from uh, the CEO of Make It Cheaper and um, Make It Cheaper places an important emphasis on ensuring that all employees are involved in making suggestions for process improvements. Fred, are you able to share with us a little bit about some of the programs and initiatives that are, are available to your employees and um, highlight some successes you have had along the way? Yeah, sure, Shrink. I would love to. Thank you. 
first of all, I need to look the, you guys up with Avenue Dental because uh, it sounds like it sounds like a better better dental practice than the one I'm used to. It's a good pitch by you guys. Uh, let me briefly talk to you about Make It Cheaper. We're, we're a great, great business. We're closing in on 100 employees in terms of size. What we do is uh, we help our customers save money and time. And we do that by comparing what they pay for energy bills and we switch them to a better plan. Uh, of the 100 people, 60 to 70 are customer facing uh, in a call center. And um, I'll talk about those people because they are, I think, the ones that are most important when it comes to innovation. Because when I think about innovation, there's like every day small steps of innovation then there's big strategic moves and i'll give a few examples of those as well but coming back to what we do everything we do is underpinned by our culture as well so same things we've got values that are very much alive the values are passion trust and expertise and they are under underpinned with performance statements like better never stops and talent is not enough and we have defined what those things look feel and sound like for every role in the organization so it's very specific we also have a business that's very rhythmic, so we've got lots of cadence, lots of touch points at all level. And let me give you one example. So in our in our business, we work in a highly regulated industry in energy, and we look at contracts. Um, lots of the contracts and regulation is in place to protect the customer, but it's also bloody boring sometimes. So we need to go through lots of terms and conditions. And actually, our agents are super good at making sure that we can fine tune the scripts and the things we say to our customers when we take them from one contract to another by making the formulation and the amount of words smaller or making it more customer friendly. And those are innovations we always invite them to come, come forward with in the many catch ups we have with them. And then what we do is we bring those ideas that the agents, the customer facing people have to the energy retailers that we work with. So the companies like AGL and Origin, et cetera, to also make their acceptance of contracts much more customer friendly. So at the end of the day, because of that, the customer wins because what we tell them is easier to digest. We win as a business because we gain some productivity um, and the retailer that wins the business in that case wins as well because they get a better customer who is more likely to go live. So it's a good example. And we always like to stimulate our staff to give as many practical examples as they have, because I believe that one percenters, if you've got 100 of them every day, you can do the maths, you know, it can, can have a significant impact. Similarly, we invite them to come up with feedback about specific product features, about the products that we feature uh, to our customer, specific terms and conditions around rates and payment terms and everything like that, which we then again relay back to the retailers and put into practice, making a better proposition for everybody. And then let me also give you an example about you know, the bigger end of town. So we've recently gone through a strategy uh, review process where we invited pretty much half of the company and we were fortunate enough actually to do that face to face, which I think for innovation often is easier. Uh, so we had a, a big day, a couple of days actually, where we kind of laid the land and we looked at the market and all kinds of things. And we then asked the teams to come up with uh, proposals for what we called a business canvas, which is basically you know a description of what the business model would look like and the customer proposition would look like. And that was phenomenal. They loved it and they really we got them, gave them lots of tools, uh, digital tools and visual tools to come up with uh, uh, the, the business proposition of the future and we ended up asking them pitching their ideas to the wider audience kind of dragon's den style um, and it wasn't just shits and giggles it was serious business stuff with great ideas they came up with which actually fundamentally helped us frame the ultimate strategy that we're now executing and investing in uh, in terms of digitizing our business diversifying our business further so again involving the people that are on the call phase and speak to customers every time driven by the culture and the purpose that we have, um, both on a rhythmic day-to-day -day level and then sometimes when it's relevant on a very strategic level, yeah, I can just tell that it really creates a lot of excitement. It makes people very proud in what they do. Of course, we've had some challenges in terms of retention and recruitment over the last certainly six to 12 months, although it feels like things are stabilizing a bit again. But I really believe that involving people um, I really, we, we, we don't really talk about up or down uh, communication. We just in it together. And I know, you know, in reality, we have a little bit of a hierarchy as you do, but the guys feel very, very involved. And when we measure how they feel about the business, because that we do regularly as well, that's what they come back with. So final point, also for us as leadership, better never stops. So we're never happy. I know that there's still more to do. So it's great to uh, be in this webinar as well. And here's from some of the ideas of the other guys. Oh, thank oh, you. Thank you. 
And uh, yeah, it's so important, you know, for organisations to engage the front line. So many organisations still don't do that. But at the end of the day, at the front line is where your customers are meeting your organisation. And it's important to, to gather that feedback and see what else can be done. Um, we're all in a continual cycle of improvement. Nothing will <laughs> ever be done. <laughs> and fantastic. So the more input we can get along the way, the um, easier that journey will be. And it's definitely more fun when you get engage more people through the organisation to do that. Uh, next up, we have Caroline Atia, Head of People and Culture at Coloplast. Welcome uh, to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. At, at Coloplast, you have quite a few methods uh, in which employees can ask questions and share uh, feedback to managers, including senior managers. Have you found that some of the methods and strategies have been more effective than others? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really important question. And I love the fact that we've paired both feedback and innovation and hearing some of the speakers earlier too has been super inspiring. And I think the reality is as an organization in this day and age, if, if you want to grow or even stay relevant for that matter, then you need to be innovative. And innovation requires feedback, whether it be from your team, your consumers, your customers, be it good or, or bad. So that we so we need to, as organizations, get really good at listening and creating really intentional opportunities for feedback uh, within our businesses, but also create the cultures where people feel safe, right, to be able to come to us and give us that feedback as well, really openly. But equally, have the assurance that something will be done with the feedback that they give us or at least be considered. So I'll share with you some strategies uh, to answer your question as well around what we do formally and informally to get some feedback. At a high level, we've got a communication framework which really highlights all the feedback and communication options available to anyone at any time. So you can pick this up and know exactly who I need to go to, what options and what cadences are available to me to raise uh, concerns or share any feedback and communicate. The obvious one, of course, is directly with their managers through regular one-on-ones. We have a minimum expectation within our business that individually each manager and employee have a meeting at least once a month, once a month and they choose what that cadence is. For some employees, it could be, listen, once a month is plenty and that gives me enough chance to really engage and connect, or once a week, it just depends on what the agreement is between both employees. We, uh, the other thing that we don't do at, at Coloplast is we actually don't do egos, right? So all of our exec team members, mobile phones, emails are accessible, which really has allowed, you know, it could be through a WhatsApp message or a text message, come share feedback, talk to us and ask us any questions. We do things uh, that have been really proven to be effective, such as ad hoc pulse checks. And what I mean by that, if there is, say, a business unit within our business where we might be hearing some, some noise or some feedback that isn't necessarily positive, we will then book a time individually. I might meet with, with the teams and say, okay, talk to me, what's happening? Good, bad, indifferent, what's, what's, what's causing some of that feedback? And I think really being equally putting accountability on us as a business, but then also saying, we have a, a principle where we say, I lead A and Z. So we push back and say, okay, so what's our role as an organization to address this, but equally, what role can you play here to support and to address and to lead A and Z? We have uh, monthly business-wide breakfast meetings too, where the VP and exec team members uh, provide feedback on the business, business and updates. Every employee has a chance, of course, to ask questions at the end, but we also allow employees to email us separately before, uh, before the meetings to be able to ask questions at that time, so they don't feel like they're, on the, they're put on the spot at the time uh, within that forum of, of asking questions. We've got the obvious anonymous suggestion and feedback box, and again, Employees are given the option to share their details if they want or keep it completely anonymous, whatever makes them comfortable. And what we do with that feedback is uh, that that feedback, we then catch up as an exec meeting at our, at our weekly catch ups. And we say we've had some feedback here. Let's look at addressing it. And how do we then communicate that back to the business? Um, of course, we're appropriate. So they actually have an understanding that we are hearing that feedback and we are doing something with it. And that could be in the form of that breakfast meeting or a town hall meetings, whatever is appropriate for us to address this. Another really effective uh, feedback tool that we use is, is what we call a skip level meeting. And that's where an exec team member will meet with teams. So they'll skip a layer of leadership and meet with teams. So they'll come to the meeting with absolutely no agenda. And they'll say, talk to me, what's happening in the business? What are you loving about working at Coloplast? What could we do better? You know, what's really niggling you? What's stopping you from 
performing your job at your at your best. And that again has allowed us to get some really great intimate open feedback. We then go away and communicate that to the relevant parties and then come back and transparently communicate that within the business. Lastly, on the informal part, we also have quarterly HR meetings. So the goal of that is to really demystify what the HR does, but also it's a, it allows us to really open that communication channel between both parties. So again, employees are given the, the option to ask us questions during the uh, HR meetings, or of course, ask their questions beforehand and they're addressed in that meeting. And uh, from a formal uh, perspective, we also have our engagement surveys. I know I heard a couple of other speakers talk about this also. We do them twice a year and it's run through an external uh, provider called PECON. Um, and we then again, once we get the results, we communicate them really frequently. Uh, we communicate them transparently and then we create an action plan that we check in with the business on on a quarterly basis and report back on. Um, we've just closed our last uh, survey last week, and I'm happy to report that we've had an over 90% uh, uh, response rate, and we had an engagement score of 8.6 out of 10, which is one that we're really proud of. That sounds great. I think you made two really important points. One is that feedback, um, we sh the employees should have a uh, choice on whether they wanted to be anonymous or, uh, or whether they would wish to share their details because that definitely does increase the participation of honest feedback and, uh, and, and honest inputs. And also importantly is addressing it. Uh, it's one thing to collect the feedback, it's another thing to address it. And you know, going back to a very, very old example that I keep on pulling out, um, this happened in the early 2000s, new managing partner for Deloitte came to Australia. He had uh, many conversations in his first 30 days about everything that was wrong uh, with with Deloitte and things that didn't work. And uh, he decided to run a campaign called the Dumbest Things campaign. And there was a blog available where you could um, uh, sit, write, write a submission around something you didn't understand why it had to work the way that he did. And every single blog was assigned to a partner and it had to be investigated and every uh, submission had to have a response. And out of the 400 odd submissions, there were over 300 changes to processes within the organization because sometimes, you know, large organizations, legacy programs get lost along the way since so there are parts of the organization we forget to change things at. Uh, and it's something that has evolved over the past couple of decades at Deloitte and, um, and it's a big part of how they improve things. Uh, so our last question back to Avenue Dental. Uh, Stephen. Uh, at Avenue Dental, you believe that the key to being able to listen to your employees is through the role of Bob, uh, and um, that's the role a practice manager has. I'll allow you to elaborate a little bit more on uh, what Bob stands for and what their role is and um, how, how that works. Well, thanks so much for having us. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, I think you have to have a structure that actually supports feedback. And so I'll definitely touch on the Bob, Bob role and go through that. But really, um, we have multiple levels. So really, see three major things. So one is technology. And so we use uh, WebEx Teams. And it just means anyone can contact anyone in the organisation. So right now, anyone could just shoot Elon and I a message. It's not like them. They have to go through multiple layers. They can just set us something. And that's the same with all, all senior leadership or anyone in any of the seven locations. Uh, everyone's got our email, everyone's got our mobile, so it's just people can chat and bring things up as needed. Uh, our structure as well would be the second point. We have a, a owner in each location, a partner in each location uh, with an ownership stake in the practice. So it means that then there's someone who owns that business in that business and like they want that to succeed. So there's always um, someone there who's present and able to receive the feedback. And we have a practice manager in each location as well. And finally, then we have a meeting rhythms that support it all. So uh, this is where the feedback really kicks in. I find with the, the meeting rhythms are great. So daily, you have a daily huddle. Um, you have then an end of day checklist as well. And part of the end of day checklist uh, is a two second lean. So I think this is similar to what Fred was touching on where we look for, it's a two second improvement. It doesn't have to be earth shattering. And so just be moved the goals from, back behind you to here, and so you don't have to twist, and then it saves two seconds of the time. Great, let's let's do that, let's implement that across all the all the practices. And so trying to look for little gains on a daily basis, 
daily goes to weekly. So we have weekly coaching conversations uh, around people's individual coaching plans. So I always joke that we love TLAs to three of oh, stuff that up. I'm sure <laughs> that through that acronyms. Um, so <laughs> so um, with this, the weekly coaching conversations and um, the Bob, so is bringing out the best in others. So trying to then coach all the team members uh, on a weekly basis as so you've got weekly coaching. With that, it's around our individual coaching plans. So everyone has a coaching plan, which is around our values. So it's not like the values are an added extra, like you've got to reach these KPIs and there's also this values thing, you've got to do extra stuff for that. It's just, it's all ingrained. So uh, as an example, maybe excellence value, um, then on that scope of practice is part of it. So try and expand the scope of what you can clinically do. And that's just one of the one of the areas and trying to grow that. Um, so that broad role, as you said, the practice managers, media, all the team members, and it's trying to progress in their ICP. Everything has red, yellow, green criteria and it's trying to progress to green is the, is the goal. Um, then we also have weekly team meetings at each locations. Then monthly, uh, we have monthly goal settings so people actually set goals around their um, their ICPs. So try to then progress on on different areas of the, their life. And then we also have a monthly manager report. So each of the partners in each location you give me direct feedback to myself and Eli and, and see how they're progressing. So that's how we then have all the um, the three levels, I suppose, that enable feedback in terms of the technology, the actual structure and ownership structure, and then the meeting rhythms. Um, on top of that, then we have a process of change a document. So this is when people want to implement larger changes across the organisation. So rather than just a two second lean, it's like making something uh, more substantial change. So for example, it might be recently we've had the implementation of intraoral scanners. So rather than having physical impressions, it's digital scans. Um, moving to digital workflow for our dental implants so we can then virtually plan where we're going to place a titanium implant to replace a missing tooth and then have um, that following a, a guide and then you follow that digital workflow. Um, or even implementing IV sedation uh, with an anaesthetist to be able to enable wisdom tooth removal. Uh, it's not a pleasant thing to go through, so <laughs> making it slightly more pleasant as a, um, as a process. Oh, that sounds great. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. It's uh, definitely interesting. Uh, you know, it's interesting to hear about different organisations and the different things that you do and how at the end of the day it all comes back to we have wonderful team members who are full of knowledge and insights and observations and um, they're all things that we need to gather and collect and encourage so that we can continue to grow and be innovative and uh, amazing workplaces. I would like to thank you all once again for being part of the webinar today and for being part of the series. We are, uh, as you can imagine, deep in research mode and the 2022 Best Places to Work study will be announced on August, 20, on August 4th. So uh, really keen to see you all then, see how everyone has gone and where the best workplaces are. And as I mentioned, we will start our 2022 live series uh, shortly after that. Thank you again. You've been a wonderful part of today's conversation. Really appreciate it.